So chapter 40 through 48, remember, this kind of sums up the rest of the book of the prophet Ezekiel. This is, this is a... This is good. It's, it's, it's really a time in which we see God's future for Israel. This is the time of really the millennial kingdom, and we're going to look a little bit at that tonight just to refresh us as we look at chapter 41, 42, and 43. But You know, I've kind of already determined that by the time we're done with Ezekiel, I would like to, for a moment, kind of step out of, outside of the normal flow of how we teach on Sundays and Wednesdays here. Uh, If you don't know, we we teach through the Old Testament, mainly the historical books and the prophets on Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, we do all the poetical books, all the books that are poetry, which are like the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, the book of Job, those are all poetical books. And those are what we tackle on Sunday nights. And then when we finish those, as we have here, I start, well, we started to pick up some of the prophets to kind of end teaching through the Old Testament on Sunday night. So right now we only have the prophet Jeremiah, and then we've already taught through the whole Bible in 18 years. But what I want to do is... I think I can, after the book of Ezekiel, I I would like to, just because of what's happening in the world today and what we're reading in Ezekiel, I would like to start the book of Revelation uh, once we're done with Ezekiel. So I'll kind of break from the flow of our normal teaching. So uh, we'll get to Jeremiah and we will finish it before the years, uh, you know, the next year ends, okay? So... We will finish it, I promise you, okay? So because I was so excited as, you know, we'll get it started, you know, and before the year's over, we'll already be in Jeremiah, and then, you know, by maybe spring, we would probably be done of 24 with Jeremiah, and then it's like, that's it, I've taught through the whole Bible. So I want to teach Revelation because I think it would be something that we just need to, you know, re-kind of educate ourselves in our eschatology and where we are, and what we believe, and the teaching of the end times. And so that, that'll be my sixth time teaching through Revelation chapter by chapter, verse by verse in 18 years. So it's going to be very extensive, a lot of information as we always do. But I, but I just want to put that in there because, you know, I'm looking at this even tonight as I was in my, my studies, just kind of recapping some of the stuff. And I says, you know, <clears throat> this is really a message of hope. And after Ezekiel had been ministering to the people of Judah in the southern kingdom, this is a good word, a good message, the good news, if you will, after hearing so much bad news. Now, remember, one thing you cannot get away from is that the people of Israel, Judah, in the southern kingdom, they really thought it was over. They thought that God was done with them. And sin can make you feel that way. God doesn't make us feel that way. Sin will make you feel that way because sin is what what affects our relationship with God. In chapter 37 and verse 11, the Bible says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Listen to this. Our hope is lost. And and from the outside looking in, you would say they are in a very hopeless and helpless situation. Then we get to chapter 40 because, you know, there in 37, Ezekiel 37 and 38 and 39, we see that when they got to that brink or that point, of them believing that all hope was lost, then God says, I will destroy your enemies. And he reminds them in chapter 37, 38, 39, you know, the the battle of Gog and Magog. And then it kind of leads into this great defeat and it's encouraging them. But remember, he says that this will not happen in their lifetime, but it'll happen in a time that is to come 
And he also says in chapter 39, he goes on to say in all of this, this will be done for what reason? Then the nations, verse 7, at the close of verse 7, chapter 39, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Now, looking at this, we then get into chapter uh, 40, and we see here a new city, this vision of a new city and a new temple. And remember, when Ezekiel's prophesying to the people of Judah and he's getting this out, they had just experienced their city destroyed, the temple destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. And now the Lord is saying, listen, one day I will defeat your enemies and I will build a new city and a new temple. And we looked at all these measurements last week. At this, we're going to continue with these measurements. We've seen there the measurements of the temple. Now, this is what we know to be the third temple. Okay, the third temple. Now, the third temple really is the place where, remember, Jesus warned about the abomination of desolation. What is the abomination of desolation? Jesus says, and, um, you know, as he's giving this, what is called the Olivet Discourse, you know, he says that during this time of the abomination of desolation, he says it in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, he's reminding him, he's saying, remember, as Daniel was prophesying, this abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist will rise into power, declare himself to be God, but he can only do that in the third temple. So <clears throat> this is something that we have to really, really kind of take into consideration when we're looking at the end times and the teaching of the end times, because everybody today is trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. I'll be honest with you, I don't really care who it is. Because when the third temple is built, the church won't be here. We'll be raptured, we'll be taken up. So, so my focus, more than anything, is to make Christ known, not the Antichrist. So whether you think it's Obama or Trump or <laughs> any other, <laughs> you know, leader, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter because to be honest with you, it doesn't, if we were to know, then we would have some type of passages of scripture that would show some interacting, right, with the church and the Antichrist. There's none. All the interaction with the Antichrist is with Israel. It's just a good point to highlight there because, you know, our belief is that the church will be taken up and raptured and so on and so forth. So, in the book of Revelation in chapter 20, you see here in the entirety of the chapter, really from verses 1 through verse 10, you have what is called the uh, binding of Satan. He's bound for a thousand years. And prior to this, we see that Christ comes at his second coming. And notice what it says here in regards to Christ at his second coming, he will defeat. Look at what it says in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Wow, who's that? It's us. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So here, the word of God, which is his name, is none other than who? Jesus. How do we know this? Well, John chapter 1. In verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus. And the Bible is saying here that Jesus will come with an army, and He will come to rule them with a rod of iron. Now, this is really important. A rod of iron really means swift, with authority, with strength, and you might say, if Christ comes at his second coming, what would be the need 
what would be the need for him to rule with a rod of iron? Keep in mind that the tribulation period is a time of judgment and testing for Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Its purpose is to turn the nation of Israel to God. And ultimately it will. So here's what's interesting. The judgments, and we'll get into this when we get in Revelation, each judgment, the, the trumpets, the seal, the bull judgments, all of those pour out really judgment. And then ultimately these things lead to the wrath of God being poured out in the second half of the tribulation. And a lot will be destroyed, but not everything. So there will be still people on the earth that will survive the tribulation. So that's not Jesus' second coming. It's the tribulation. Here we're seeing the second coming of Jesus. So after the tribulation is over, Jesus will come to the earth here to defeat the enemies of God with his army. He will rule with a rod of iron. And what does that mean? It means that he has to rule with authority even though he's coming, people will still resist him because the earth is still in its state of fallenness. The earth is not redeemed or, or, or how could we say, um, a new heaven and a new earth, not until after the millennial kingdom. All things become new. So during this time, we see here that Christ comes and it says, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Verse 15, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Talk about this battle, man. Then the beast was captured. That's the Antichrist. And with him, the false prophet. That's the one who will come into power and kind of woo the people. Remember, you have the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. We call this here the unholy trinity. Satan desires to be like God. He, Isaiah clearly teaches it, that he wants to be like God. So, so he creates this false narrative that he has power, that he has authority. But notice here, Ultimately, the Antichrist will be captured. The false prophet will be captured. The false prophet is kind of like the Holy Spirit. You see, the false prophet will be the one to go and tell the people, worship the Antichrist. He's worthy of your praise. Both empowered by Satan. And it says here um, that the beast, the Antichrist, will be captured. The false prophet who works signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. And those who worshiped his image. Everything is setting up today for the mark of the beast. I mean, everything is falling into place for there to be a one world currency. For there to be, you know, you see today with the capabilities and the abilities, so much fraud and so much theft going on. And, and so everything's going to be eventually at some point, um, you know, becoming more, how could we say, sophisticated, but making it easier. In other words, not so many different currencies, just one. Here's one way to have it. And whatever the mark of the beast is, I know a lot of people say, you know, it's going to be, you know, a chip. It's going to be, you know, this or that. You know, it could be. And it could not be. It could be simp something as simple as rejection. A and those who reject have to identify themselves that way. Kind of like today when you see it on the media, you know, people that are rejecting who God is, they identify themselves by certain markings or certain things, you know? So it could be a, a chip in, in the right hand and in the, and in the forehead. It could be a barcode. People say it's a barcode. People say it's a chip. People say it's a tattoo, you know? So we shouldn't get tattoos kind of thing. But, 
But either way, whatever it is, we're not going to be here for it, so I really don't care. But we do see that, that the technology is, is bringing us to a place where they're able to kind of keep their eye on everybody. And one of the greatest ways to do it is, you know, what you have in your pocket or in your purse that you're always asked to put on silent mode during the teaching of the word. They're able to track you with something so simple as your phone. And it's becoming more sophisticated, more advanced, right? And, and if you notice, too, in our world, technology is becoming that which is whoever advances in technology really now has become the one who's pretty much in charge and it's become that even our military and the weaponry is is you know advanced in technology and for the most part us as a country here we're 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 still ahead of the game in that but this is what this is becoming and so the mark of the beast will be kind of somewhat in that way, to be able to, to track everybody and those who kind of identify themselves that way will then, in a sense, have received this and, and have become a part of this. So notice here that he goes on to say that those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So nobody is in the lake of fire right now as we speak. The first two people that will hit the lake of fire is the Antichrist and the false prophet. And it goes on to say here, the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old. Remember the serpent in Genesis 3.1? Who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Satan's bound for a thousand years. You know, when people say things like, I bind Satan. Uh, you ain't binding him. Somebody keeps letting him go. Jesus will bind him. And it'll be for a thousand years, and he will be in chains. Listen to this, in the bottomless pit. Remember when Jesus casts the demons from the demoniac in Mark chapter 5. Remember that demon-possessed guy? And on our last trip to Israel, we stayed in an area of the Galilee that wasn't too far from Gadara. Gadara is the place where this happened. And one of the evenings, me and my wife were sitting, looking out at the uh, water there. It's one of her favorite stories. And um, she says, one of the highlights for me is when you sat there and you showed me where this actually took place. And you could still see the tombs there on the side of the, of the mountain that go down into the water where um, the cemetery was, where the demoniac was in, and Jesus met him there. And the pigs were cast uh, the, kid, the pigs fall into the sea because the demons were cast into them. But prior to that, the demon legion, the many demons pleaded with Jesus and they said, do not cast us, not, do not cast us in the abuso. The abuso is the bottomless pit. And in the book of Jude, it says that the angels that left their, their proper domain, their proper abode, where they were with the Lord at one time in heaven in glory and now have become fallen angels because they've followed Satan in his deception, it says there were those who were reserved in chains for the day of judgment. Well, Satan here will be bound just like those who the Lord had bound years before. And I believe that the abuso is what we read this morning in Luke chapter 16, where the story of Lazarus and the rich man, where Abraham says to the rich man, Lazarus can't go and touch your tongue with water on his finger because there's a great chasm, a great gulf fixed between us. And I believe there that is the abuso. That's the bottomless pit. And that's where the angels in Jude are reserved in chains for a time of judgment. This is where Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished, but after these things, he must be released for a little while. 
So you look at this and you say, Satan will be bound for the millennial kingdom. Yes, he will. Because Christ will bind him. And then we get to Ezekiel chapter 40, 41, 42, and 43, and we see the measurements of the temple. Now, look at chapter 41. Now, remember that what we just read in Revelation is what Ezekiel is trying to articulate to them, but the book of Revelation was not written in Ezekiel's day. So God is giving him hope and saying, listen, Israel will learn what it is one day to not forsake the Lord their God, but to worship him. And remember that early on in Ezekiel's prophecy, we see something very interesting. We see that the glory of the Lord departed in chapter 11. And in these next couple of chapters, Ezekiel in a vision is going to see the glory and the presence of God come once again. Now, remember, the people in Ezekiel's day are saying, all our hope is lost. These chapters are saying, no, there is hope, and it is coming. Verse 41, then he brought me up into the sanctuary and, the, and measured the doorpost six cubits wide on one side and six cubits wide on the other side. The width of the tabernacle, the width of the entryway was 10 cubits, and the side walls of the entrance were five cubits on this side and five cubits on the other side, 40 cubits, and it's width 20 cubits. Now, by these measurements, Ezekiel encouraged the people. And notice here that this is not the holy place, but the sanctuary, the outer court area before getting into um, the center part of the, the temple where the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord would be behind that veil would be the Holy of Holies. And here he's speaking about the sanctuary side of it. Now, Ezekiel was a priest, but he was not a high priest. So Ezekiel is not able to measure the holy place, but he's able to measure the sanctuary. The priests were able to go into the sanctuary, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Also, he went inside and measured the doorpost, two cubits, and the entrance six cubits high, and the width, and the entrance seven cubits. Verse four, he measured the length 20 cubits, and the width 20 cubits beyond the sanctuary, and he said to me, this is the holy place. So the angel that had been leading him and showing him measured the holy place. So perhaps maybe the restriction here, or man's, in other words, we can see here that there is a restriction in having open access to God's holiness. Now, in the temple, that always was. Man was restricted in his own ability to go, but only the angel could measure this. Why? Because he was able to go in the holy place. Remember that in Isaiah chapter 6, notice what the Bible says about the angels before the throne of God. These are not cherub angels. These are seraphim, which are a little bit different. And, and really, the difference between the cherub angels and the seraphim really are descriptions found in how they look. The seraphim here in Isaiah chapter 6 said that they, in verse 3, they cried to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So what they're seeing here, what Isaiah is seeing in Isaiah chapter 6, is God's presence in glory. And the angels fly around the throne of the Lord, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So angels in this regard can go in the most holy place. And, and these were, it says here, uh, with, the, with the seraphim in verse 2, Chapter 6, above it, seraphim, each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, meaning daring not to gaze directly at the presence of God's holiness. There was a reverence there. With two, he covered his feet. The idea here is daring not to come on his own accord, to stand in a certain way before the presence of God or to come in that regard. And with the other two, he flew. In other words, serving 
in service, flying around the throne of God, acknowledging that they're in a lowly state by covering their feet, covering their face, and then serving the Lord by flying around. So the angel here, kind of like the angel of Isaiah 6, had, a, had the ability to go into a very holy place. Now, image number one, as we're going to draw up on the screen here, kind of gives us this vast uh, you know, picture here of what we're looking at in Ezekiel. This is Ezekiel's third temple. And ultimately, if you notice here, there's a schematic um, that kind of looks like the smaller one here, if we could put that up real quick. So this is kind of what we're looking at. This is each of the storage chambers that we were reading last time. And so we'll kind of just leave this up right now and then we'll kind of work our way through a little bit more. And as we're reading this, you can kind of look up and then you'll see. In verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, you'll notice here, it's speaking about this, see where the inner court is, right? And then you see the altar. And then you see the holy place. That is the area that would be known as the sanctuary, the most holy place, right where it says the word temple, the most holy place is just right behind it. So this is what we're looking at here in this section here. And it goes on to say here, he measured the length, 20 cubits, and its width, 20 cubits, and beyond the sanctuary. And he said to me, this is the most holy place. Verse 5. Next, he measured the wall. The temple was six cubit. The width of the each side chamber all around the temple was four cubits on every side. And if you notice here, there's chambers around it. See all those little chambers around it. So that's what they're measuring right there. All those little squares right there. Those are all chambers, just like these ones are storage chambers. The small ones are around there. This is where we're at on here. And then he goes on to say here, the side chambers were three stories and above the other 30 chambers in each story. They rested on ledges, which were for the side chambers all around that they might be supported but not fastened to the wall of the temple. Now go to the other schematic that we have that's a little bit more detailed in 3D. The first one you put up. And notice there how it's, it's, it's kind of showing there. So we see here the chambers that are all around, each of these chambers, outer chambers. And then here in verse um, 6, where it says here the side chambers were three stories above, and the other 30 chambers in each story rested on ledges. Now, if you look at that, you'll see the, the chambers that were around it. There are three stories. You see that small little section there? There are three stories, one, two, and three. And there's, there's 30 of them all around, fastened. As one went up from story to story, the side chambers became wider all around because the supporting ledges in the wall of the temple ascended like steps. You see that there? Therefore, the width of the structure increased as one step went up from the lowest story to the highest by way of the middle one. I also saw an uh, uh, elevation all around the temple, and it was the foundation of the side chambers, a full rod that is six cubits high. The thickness of the outer wall of the side chambers were five cubits, and so also the remaining terrace by the place of the side chambers of the temple and between it and the wall chambers was a width of 20 cubits all around the temple on every side. The doors of the side chambers opened on the terrace, one door toward the north, another door toward the south, and the width of the terrace was five cubits all around. Now this is the building here at the western end, the building that faced the separating courtyard and its western end was 70 cubits wide. And so this is that building there on the western end. You see it? Building at the western end. This is what it's speaking about. So right now we've just went around the temple, the chambers. Now there's the building at the western end. And notice what it says there. It says, we're 70 cubits wide. The wall of the building was five cubits thick all around in its length, 90 cubits. So he measured the temple, 100 cubits long. The separating courtyard with the building and its walls was 100 cubits long. So you see um, the temple, you see that it was a separate. You have the um, inner court, northern gateway, the inner court, eastern gateway, the inner court, southern gateway. There was no western gateway because the main wall to the temple mount, as we would call it today, 
is the Western Wall. That's the wall. Um, if the temple was up there today in Israel, if it was there, that wall goes down. You look from there, you'll look straight down, and you'll see the Jews praying today. They pray to this day at that wall. That's the reason why they pray at that wall, because it is the only wall remaining that goes back to the time in which the temple was there. So <clears throat> then it goes on to say here in verse 14, also the width of the eastern face of the temple, including the separating courtyard, was 100 cubits, which is about 175 feet square. He measured the length of the building behind it, facing the separating courtyard and its galleries, and on one side and on the other side, 100 cubits, as well as the inner temple and the porches of the court, their doorpost and the beveled window frames and the galleries all around their stories opposite the threshold were paneled with wood from the ground to the windows. The windows were covered from the space above the door even to the inner room as well as the outside and every wall all around inside and outside by measure. Now, some would argue and say that this here is really uh, the construction plans for the temple in Ezra's day. Now, remember that Zerubbabel led the captives from their captivity. So those that are captive here in Ezekiel's day would be captive for 70 years. And 586 was the final time in which the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The southern kingdom of Israel was taken captive. And their 70-year captivity began when Babylon first besieged the city. So they first besieged the city in 605 B.C. And then they took captives then. They took captives again in 597 B.C. And then for a third time they went and then destroyed the city and the temple in 586 B.C. So 70 years captivity would bring them to about 535 B.C. 535, 536 B.C. So they come out of the captivity and the temple is destroyed. It's gone. And then under the leadership of Zerubbabel, you'll read this in the book of Ezra, the first six chapters, you'll see they come out of the captivity and for 15 years, they, they don't rebuild the temple. They, they build houses, and then the Lord, you know, rebukes the people and says, you've, you've built your well-paneled houses and everything, but, you know, you need to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And so they did. They rebuilt the temple of the Lord, 516 B.C., and that temple remained intact and standing even in Jesus' day. Ultimately, it was destroyed in 70 A.D., and that's why there's no temple there today. All you see is the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, has no temple there. Well, one day, this temple here, which will be the third temple, that will be, I guess you can say through a peace agreement, is the best way to describe it, and we'll get into this more in Revelation when we get there, but the Antichrist will be able to create an agreement with the Arabs and the Jews, and ultimately, the Jews will be able to build their third temple. And today, the Arabs, they have possession of the Dome of the Rock. They have possession of the Temple Mount. And this is why today there's no third temple there. But outside of that, in the old city in Jerusalem, there is, and I mentioned this already, there is a place called the Temple Institute. And this place is not ran by Judeo-Christians. It's not, there's no... There's nothing about Christianity there at all whatsoever. This is a Jewish organization that their main goal and purpose is to train young Hebrew men with the last name Cohen, which means that they're somehow related to the priesthood, Aaron's priesthood. And so they're training them on how to do biblical sacrifices and offerings. So this is what they're doing, because remember, the Jews, they feel that there's no ability to sacrifice or to do any of that if there's no temple. So since 70 AD up till our time, till today, 
there's not been sacrifices in the land of Israel. So this organization called the Temple Institute, their main objective is that. And when you go into their museum, because they let people go in there to see what they have, they're, they're saying, look, this is where we are with this. They have 95% of everything that's needed to do the sacrificial system today. If there's a temple, they can furnish it. They can do everything. The only thing that will not be in the third temple is the Ark of the Covenant. The last time we see the Ark of the Covenant is the time of the kings, right? And, and, and we see when Babylon besieged the city, we, we don't hear of the Ark of the Covenant anymore. And when they come out of the captivity, they don't bring it with them. In the second temple, there's, there's, there's some things missing like that. <laughs> so they have all these things. They have an altar in there. If you go to the third picture that they put up, it's a picture of the millennial altar. And this altar here is made out of brick in that place. And we've seen it. Those of you that have gone with us, you're here tonight. You've seen it. This is it. This is the altar for Ezekiel's um, the, uh, vision of the millennial altar. So going back to the other schematic that we were just at here, you'll see that all of this is for the purpose of there to be a third temple. Now, here, Ezekiel is saying there will be a time in which God's people will be able to worship the Lord again. So remember, in chapter 36, what did they say? Or 37, they said, listen, all is lost. In verse 11, they indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost. This whole picture here, for us, it's like cubits this, cubit that, this cubit high, that cubit, you know. And all we read this and we're like, oh man, what is, this was giving hope to them because they understood how long it took for the temple to be built. Remember in Jesus's day, when he said that the temple would be destroyed and, and he spoke concerning his body and he said the temple would be destroyed, 46 years later that happened. Because at least in Jesus, from Jesus's day to the time that it happened, it took about 46 years just to do a little bit more work on the temple. So you can imagine how long it took the temple, the details of how it went into. Now, I was sharing with someone about um, going underground in what is called the Western Wall Tunnel. The Western Wall is the place where the Jews pray, but down below, there are stones that date back to the time in which Solomon built the temple. These stones are massive. They are massive. They are probably, and I'm not exaggerating, maybe from the backside of the sanctuary to, I don't know, maybe about up to this third window right here, which would make it the second one. That long, they're, they're 45 feet long. And they are, I mean, they're massive. And these stones were placed there. Think of it in Solomon's day. I mean, what type of machinery did they have? Uh, none. But these stones today are put so precisely together that to this day, archaeologists are still baffled as to how they were able to slide these stones into place. And they're there. So these measurements are very important because what it's doing is it's bringing, it's birthing hopelessness to give them hope. Verse 18, it says, and it was made with, cher uh, with cherubim and palm trees. Now remember those who, um, those who guard God's dwelling place, the cherubim. And palm trees, meaning fruitfulness between the cherub and each cherub had two faces so that the face of a man was toward a palm tree on one side and the face of a young lion. So some would say, what is the purpose of this? What, what is the, the imagery there of this? Well, one representing humanity. Secondly, here, perhaps the young lion representing because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the kingship of the Messiah. And toward a palm tree and on the other side, thus it was made throughout the temple all around. From the floor to the space above the door and from the wall of the sanctuary, the cherubim and the palm trees were carved. The doorposts of the temple were square, as was the front sanctuary. Their appearance was similar. So the altar, the altar of incense, you see the altar there going back to the image that we were just at. This is a different altar, but you see the altar there in the front. 
The altar of incense was a place in which they would go. And the altar of incense was a place to offer up offerings in prayer. The altar in Ezekiel's temple in that day was to offer up burnt offerings. We're going to look at the dimensions of the altar in that. But notice here, this is the altar of incense of wood, three cubits high with its length, two cubits in its corners, its length and its sides were of wood. And he said to me, this is the table that is before the Lord. The temple and the sanctuary had two doors and the doors had two panels apiece, two folding panels, two panels for one door and two panels for the other door. The cherubim and the palm trees were carved on the doors of the temple just as they were carved on the walls. A wooden canopy was on the front of the vestibule bowl outside, and there were beveled window frames and palm trees on one side of the, and the other, and the sides of the vestibule bowl also on the sides of the chambers of the temple and on the canopies. Now here's the chamber for the priest, chapter 42. Then the angel brought me out into the outer court by the way. So notice, then he, which is the angel, led Ezekiel out to the outer court toward the north, and he brought me into the chamber, which is opposite, separating the courtyard, which was opposite the building toward the north. So here we see here several adjacent structures that surround um, the temple. Now, you know, when you look at today, and you'll see the, the, the space there. I don't know if we have an aerial shot of the Temple Mount, but, you know, we believe that that's where the temple was. It's the only flat surface or place when you look at Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city that's on a hill. It's on a hill. To this day, it's on a hill. And the only flat surface on that hill is where the Dome of the Rock is today. And you could see in the picture very clearly that, you know, the Dome of the Rock does not take up the totality of the space, but, but a portion of it. Then you'll see that there's also the Al-Aqsa Mosque that's there because the Muslims today, they, they worship on this place called the Dome of the Rock um, and on the Mount here. But there is room enough to, for, this, for the temple to be there. And... To the side of the Dome of the Rock, this is where perhaps the temple would be able to fit. And maybe that's kind of what it'll be. Maybe that's where the people realize, finally, we've re achieved peace with the Antichrist who's going to set up a false peace for three and a half years. And then the second half of the three and a half years declare himself to be God and God's wrath will be poured out. And that temple will be cleansed. It will be renewed. Jesus will come, and as we looked at chapter 40 and 41, we see here that sacrifices will be brought about once again. And so, you know, this, this, this whole section, you know, um, even that outer part, this is all still it. This is all still the Temple Mount. Uh, if we have a shot that maybe is wider that shows it kind of from a... So, so this whole section from the Dome of the Rock to the end of the wall this way. You see all those trees there under that, right above that wall, right? That whole section is open where the temple could be placed. And so there's the al Aqsar Mosque right at the very end of the picture with the black cap. There's a gold one there. There's a black one there. That is an, uh, that's the al Aqsar Mosque. And so this temple that we're looking at is going to sit right there. You see that eastern gate, that gate there. You see the wall running along? You see that little block right there? That's the eastern gate, that, that little section there. It is believed in biblical times if the eastern gate was open, you can look into the city, look up the stairs where the temple was, and if the temple doors were open, you could actually see the veil in the temple. So the eastern gate plays a significant role, and biblically speaking, Christ will come through the eastern gate at his second coming. And we're going to see here that God's glory in Ezekiel's vision enters back into Jerusalem. Guess where? Through the eastern gate. God's presence. So it's significant. It's important. And, you know, when you look at this here, you'll see all this right here is a cemetery. Those are all tombs. The Arabs put that there. All Muslim and Arabs buried there because they know that Jews can't touch a dead body or they'll be unclean for seven days. 
So you know why they put that there? Because they believe more than we do. They're like, their Messiah is going to come, and he's going to come through this gate. So let's put a cemetery in front of it because he can't touch a dead body. And you go on the back side of the, on the gate here, it's all wrought iron. And they even turned it into a little prayer room. Muslims go and they pray in there. Interesting, right? They think they got it all figured out. But we know how it's going to end. We got it right here. So you look at all these measurements, don't, you know, kind of get this in your head. And so look, looking back at the temple there that Ezekiel is, is giving, it's going to be placed right there. And just kind of get this picture in your mind. So um, Ezekiel's millennial temple will be right there. So let's go back to the temple. Let's look at that now. And then kind of place that. Um, Ezekiel's temple. That's not a temple. That's the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> so this here will be placed on that platform. Now, some would say that perhaps even the Dome of the Rock would be destroyed. That could be the case. And the temple can sit smack dab there right on that whole place. Or like in Revelation, and, and I've taught this before and I teach it there, <laughs> Almost got us arrested one time. But Revelation chapter 11, I was on there on the Temple Mount. Let, let me show you where we were standing. Go back to the closer picture where it's just the Dome of the Rock. We were probably right here. This is where we were. So the Eastern Gate is over here. It's on this side. This right here would be where there's a gate, uh, the Southern Steps. The al Mosque is right here. Then there are steps called the Southern Steps. That's where Jesus was in John chapter 7. Remember the Southern Steps where he was there and he was saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come and drink of this water. He will never thirst again. And this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. That was done down here on this part here in this section. But this area here, this right here, you know what that little tiny dome is called? It's called the Dome of the Spirits. And they call it, the, the Arabs call it Abraham's, Abraham's Dome. Now, if the eastern gate is here, and this is a side view from the, from the southern side, so it's not really a good view, but, but if the eastern gate is here, and it is, and the temple would be centered here, here's what I think is interesting. This would be the court of the Gentiles, okay? Why is this there? Well, many believe and have stated that perhaps maybe this is where the Holy of Holies was. Maybe below somewhere underground is where the Ark of the Covenant is. Under this here is a rock. It's called the Dome of the Rock. And the, 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 the Muslims believe this is where Muhammad ascended into heaven. He's never been to Jerusalem, so I don't know where they get that from. This is why it's a very holy site to the Muslims. But the Jews believe rock and all around the earth was formed. So there's some tradition but this then is the north side, right? Right outside this wall, right outside this wall is the hill Golgotha on the northern side of the city. Outside of that wall is the outside of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified outside the city on the northern side. Now, when you go back to Leviticus, uh, the Bible says in chapter 1, uh, it says to... Offer up the sacrifice of the Lord on the north side of the altar. So if this is where the altar was, where's the north side? Over here. What's on the north side? Golgotha. It's talking about Levitical sacrifices. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. He was sacrificed on the north side of the altar. I believe this is where the temple was. And I don't believe the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the place where Christ was crucified. I believe the garden tomb where we go to. But let me tell you something that's interesting about this here. And just keep this in mind. Revelation chapter 11 says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood and said, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. So here would be if the temple was there. There's outer courts. Go back to the schematic of the whole temple of uh, Ezekiel's day. I just want to show you guys what an outer court looks like. This is an outer court, this whole section. You see that word there, outer court? This is an outer court, okay? So let's say the temple was there. Where's the Dome of the Rock? It would be right here. See the southern gateway? 
it would be right there. That's just the gate. This is the temple. So there's room here, right? So just listen to this, okay? So in, in biblical times, the older temple, you had the court of the, the, court of the Gentiles. You had the court of the women because the women could only go so far. You had the outer court where the people can go, the Gentiles can go. Now go back to that image where the Dome of the Rock is. So you could put the Dome of the Rock in that section where it says the outer court. Pay attention to what this is. Now remember, this was prophesied by John the Apostle at about 95, 96 AD, about 30 some years after Jesus died. John has this revelation of Jesus and an angel gives him a measuring rod, kind of like the angel is doing with Ezekiel. And he tells him, measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside of the temple and do not measure it. Listen to this. For it has been given over to the Gentiles that they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. I like that. It has been given over to the Gentiles. In the six-day war, when Israel captured the people of Israel captured Jerusalem as their capital. They took this area and they captured it. And ultimately, if they would have secured it, they would have then built the temple probably in that time, but they didn't. They, they left it in the hands of the Arabs as a peace gesture to say, listen, we've conquered the city, but we don't want to drive you guys out. Hey, listen, we know that you guys feel that where the Dome of the Rock is it's sacred to you, but it's also sacred to us because we believe that's where our temple once was. Why don't we leave it as a peace agreement and we'll work out an agreement to... So the Arabs were like, yeah. And then once the war was over, the Arabs says, no, you can't go up there. So that's why they still have that today in their possession. So if the temple was there in biblical times, this would be the outer court that was given over to the Gentiles. It was prophesied that this would happen. So just a footnote on that there. So let's, let's look back now at Ezekiel chapter 42. And he goes on to say here, verse 2, chapter 42, facing the length, which was 100 cubits, the width was 50 cubits, was the north door, the opposite of the inner court of the 20 cubits, the opposite of the pavements of the outer court and the gallery against gallery in three stories. In front of the chamber toward the inside was a walk 10 cubits wide at a distance of one cubit, and their doors faced north. Now the upper chamber was shorter because the galleries took away space from them more than from the lower and the middle stories of the building. For they were in three stories and did not have pillars like the pillars of the courts. Therefore, the upper level was shortened more than the lower and middle levels from the ground up. And a wall which was outside ran parallel to the chambers at the front of the chambers toward the outer court. Its length was 50 cubits. The length of the chambers toward the outer court was 50 cubits, whereas the facing temple was 100 cubits. At the lower chamber was the entrance on the east side as one goes into them from the outer court. So you look at this here. It's kind of giving you this, this picture here. You have you know, the northern gate, the southern gate, and the eastern gate here. So you kind of get this picture here, and we're going to get into this whole thing of the river. We'll look at this a little bit later as we get further in. I mean, there's, there's just some remarkable things. Like one of the things that Ezekiel prophesies, that a day will come when Christ comes at his second coming during this millennial kingdom. He's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. Now, the picture that we have, that far view, and you see the, the, the wall and the cemetery, we're actually standing. I, I believe it's a picture I took. It might be, and, um, because I have several and I'm actually standing on the Mount of Olives. I'm up there right now, here, and I took a picture. And it's the best place to get a shot of all of that. Because this whole section down here, you see this here? That's a valley. That's a, a road that we drive with the buses on, but all down here, it's all a valley. This whole section right here goes steep. It goes down once you go past that, that wall there. That valley down there is, that's the Kidron Valley. You see that? in the New Testament where it says, and Jesus crossed over into the Kidron Valley. That's where he went. When Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he made his way from coming from this section, going all the way into here, just like that. That was where Jesus made his triumphal entry. I believe it's John chapter 11. But, but in all this, we're able to see here that these, these, these entrances, see the southern entrance would be right here, 
and that mosque, may, maybe that will be out of the way, um, you know, but that, those are the southern steps, so there'll be an entrance there, and the northern entrance over here, the eastern entrance there, and back there is where the western wall is. So let's go back now to the temple and its, and its measurements there. Looking now at verse <clears throat> 8. Then the length of the chambers toward the outer court was 50 cubits, whereas that facing the temple was 100 cubits. And the lower chamber was the entrance on the east side as one goes into them from the outer court. Also, there were chambers in the thickness of the wall of the court toward the east, opposite, separating the courtyard and opposite of the building. There was a walk in front of them also, and their appearance was, their appearance was like the chambers which were toward the north, and they were as long and as wide as the others, and all their exits and entrances were according to plan. And corresponding to the doors of the chambers that were facing the south, as one enters them, there was a door in front of the walk the way directly in front of the wall toward the east. Then he said to me, the north chamber and the south chambers, which are opposite, separating the courtyard, are the holy chambers where the priests who approach the Lord shall eat the most holy offerings. There they shall lay the most holy offerings, the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, for the place is holy. When the priests enter them, they shall not go out the holy chamber into the outer court, but there they shall leave their garments in which they minister, for they are holy. They shall put on the outer garments, then they may approach that, uh, that which is for the people. So this is, this is the section here that it's speaking about. Here is, as, as you notice here on each corner, you have the priest's uh, kitchen, if you will. This is where they would prepare. But this section here, it's saying they're able to to come. You have the, the, the Zodokites, which are, remember, Zadok was the priest during the time that the temple was destroyed. We're going to read a little bit more um, the next time we hear about the, uh, the Zadokites, the priest. But, but here he's saying here, there was a place for them to, to be. And so it seems that in the third temple, there's going to be priests, there's going to be offerings and sacrifices, there's going to be all operating like it was in biblical times. Now, the difference is that the millennial a temple, and in that time, Jesus has already fulfilled it all. Why are they doing it then? It is all a memorial. It's reminding them. In other words, it's giving them opportunity to come back to what it is to appreciate the presence of the Lord. You see, sacrifice always brings us to a place of repentance. Now, when he had finished measuring the inner temple, he brought me out through the gate, that faces toward the east and measured it all around. And he measured the east side with the measuring rod, 500 rods by the measuring rod all around. So this is, this is what he's talking about here, this whole section here. He's bringing him out. He's measuring it all around. So it's square. And this is kind of how it's going to sit. So we look at this, we say, man, this would fit perfect up there. Yeah, that mountain, that, that where the Dome of the Rock is today, it's the only flat surface there in Jerusalem. So without a doubt, we believe the temple was there. No, no, no doubt about that. And he measured, verse 16, the east side with the measuring rod, 500 rods by the measuring rod all around. He measured the north side, 500 rods by the measuring rod all around. He measured the south side, 500 rods by the measuring rod. And he came around to the west side and measured 500 rod by the measuring rod. He measured it on the four sides it had a wall all around, 500 cubits long, 500 cubits wide, to separate the holy areas from the common. So what I think is important here, and we're not going to get into chapter 43 tonight because it deals a lot with the holiness of God, and I want to take my time walking in that uh, for us. But in chapters 41 and 42, the purpose of this, when you look at this here, it says to separate that which is holy. This would be sacred to the Lord. The altar there where the offerings will be offered up before the Lord. All of this here to separate that which is holy from that which is common. In other words, holiness matters. And we're going to see that. 
holiness matters, especially even in the millennial kingdom. Now, remember that the people truly believed all hope was lost. It's all done. It's over. This is it. But the Lord is saying in this vision to Ezekiel, no, tell them that there is going to be a time in which my presence will dwell in their midst again. And in chapter 43, we see Ezekiel prophesying that the presence of the Lord is going to come back and dwell. Can you imagine if the temple was there today in Israel? And the presence of the Lord was among the people of Israel. This attack would have never happened. But see, this is where it's going. It's getting there. And so you look at this, and now we have a visual. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago, they says, you know, Pastor, it was a very good message, but man, we just need some kind of visual. And you, 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 you're going to look through a lot of garbage before you find something that's decent. This was as decent as it comes. People like to add all the imagery and all these things, but, but this is about as, as decent as it gets. And what was the Lord doing? The measurements might not mean nothing to you, but it meant everything to the people of Israel or the people of Ezekiel's day. Meaning what? That if God is taking the time to give us this detailed schematic of this third temple, then God will come and dwell among his people again. And he's going to find them not being faithful. At his second coming, he's going to through ruling with a rod of iron, will purify his people once again. Because to rule with a rod of iron is to rule with the word of God. And we're going to come and we're going to rule and we're going to reign with Christ in that time. You know, it's sad because today when you speak this, you know, most people will come and sit in a service like this and they're like, wow, we never knew this. Where have you been your so-called entire Christian life? Under a rock? Because you haven't been in the word. If you're in the word, you'll understand these things. And just as it gave the people of Ezekiel's day hope of something, listen, that wouldn't happen in their lifetime. But it would happen to their descendants. And you and I are seeing this come about. And this is what's so encouraging. So some people say, how can you have such strong faith when the world seems to be just falling apart? People are losing it. It's crazy out there, isn't it? And it's, it's everywhere. There's no hope. The world has believed the lie that all hope is lost. And the church, because we're still here, there is hope. And even after we're gone, there's still hope. You see in Revelation, boy, we're going to really work through that. You're going to see how the Lord, his grace extends to every generation to turn from sin and turn to him. And people will still be given the opportunity to turn to the Lord even that very close to the end. And so what do we do? We make it our aim to not only preach a message of hope, but to show others that there will be hope. All is not lost. Amen? Amen. And, and I want to encourage you guys, listen, be encouraged by what's happening. Not that, you know, there's people, these, all these protests, it's crazy, right? I mean... It's, they're, they're cracking down. They're, they are, but, but it's, 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 it's birthing this, this start of this persecution of the church. And listen, we don't need to cower down. Paul's letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, what did he say? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. What do you mean a sound mind? Because we know how this is all going to end. So when everybody was like, oh my goodness, did you see what happened in Israel? I'm just like... Yeah, praise God. Why are you not coming undone? Everything's going according to plan. That's why. So this is just pushing me closer to seeing Jesus face to face. I mean, after all, don't you guys want to see Jesus? Don't you guys want to spend eternity with the Lord? Don't you guys want to get out of this world that has fallen right and there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more? Come on, guys. You know, and, and it's just you guys. There's a lot of people that are not here. You guys are the... The faithful few. You might think it's a joke, but it's true. If you can't spend time with God's people in God's word, then I doubt you're on your way of spending eternity with the Lord. John says it about loving your neighbor. What did he say? You can't say you love God and hate your brother doesn't work that way. 
A lot of false Christs and a lot of false Christians. But only those who have their eyes on Jesus will make it. Get your eyes back on the Lord. And I'll tell you what. Expect to be, there to be good attendance on Sunday night when we start the book of Revelation because everybody thinks the book of Revelation is like a big tarot card. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how Christians treat the book of Revelation and they treat Bible prophecy. Like fortune telling. Sad. It seems to me that we have more people that go the way of the wise men looking for stars and signs rather than going the way of the disciples following Jesus all the way to the very end, even to their death. Right? Right? 